Hi, everybody. I'm PJ Kwong, and I am delighted to welcome you to the OCA COVID Town Hall. We've got lots to get to this evening, but first, a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the OCA YouTube page in the coming days. There has been a change in the order in the agenda based on the topics, question topics that were pre-submitted. Um, here's our format for this webinar. All attendees are muted. Uh, our host is going to control the slides. And the questions that were pre-submitted will be addressed throughout the presentation. There's also the option of submitting a question throughout the town hall to the panel uh, using the Q&A function that is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Simply click on the Q&A button and type in your question to be submitted to the panel. I will remind you that we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible, although many were pre-submitted and will be covered during the course of this talk, but hopefully there'll be time for more. Um, if we do get stuck on a topic, we may have to push a question to later on or to address after the town hall. So once again, I'm delighted to welcome you to this town hall. And to kick things off, I'd like to ask the OCA chair, Chris Reed, to welcome us with a few words. Chris. Uh, thank you, PJ. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, there's a lot for us to try and work through tonight. And I don't think we're going to leave here with all of the answers by any stretch. Um, I think it's safe to say that at this point, the 2021 season is not going to be the season that we had collectively hoped for. Um, what I'm hoping is that we can work together and have dialogues like tonight going forward so that we can at least get the most out of the season that we can have in 2021. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that I see tonight as the start of the discussion. It's not its entirety. Um, this is going to continue to be a long, hard road for the cycling community, and we're going to have to continue to adapt and pivot as the landscape around us changes. Uh, so we'll have to keep the conversation going. And I know a lot of different people in a lot of different roles have been working hard to make events and cycling happen for next season. One of my big hopes for tonight, and my goal for tonight, is that we can leave with a clear understanding of just what some of the constraints are for events in the province. And we can at least answer why we haven't been allowed to run more events than we have up until now. We were lucky enough that there were some excellent events that ran last summer. Time trials and an eight hour mountain bike were a huge success. My hope is that these events from last summer can give us something of a blueprint going forwards into next. Um, and my last comment before I hand over is that given the time restraints for tonight, I'd like to keep the discussion narrowly focused around the pandemic and building a calendar for next year. Uh, some of you asked questions about the strategic plan and those are fair questions, but we don't have time tonight to have two conversations and do it well. Uh, so I would ask that we focus on the one at hand and we're gonna reach out to the membership for consultation on the strategic plan. Uh, we'll have that discussion in coming months and we'll share some of the results and our take homes from the previous strategic plan that sunset last summer. Um, Cycling Canada is in the process of releasing their plan. It's already been shared with the Interprovincial Council uh, and will allow us to build on some of the work that Cycling Canada is doing in some new and emerging areas so that hopefully we can go forward with synergy and have a shared vision for a broader and more dynamic role in the years to come. So with that in mind, I would turn the screen back to Jim and tackle the business at hand. Thank you so much, Chris. That's fantastic. And before Jim gets started with uh, getting us up to date on all of um, the, the COVID um, items that we'd like to discuss tonight, I would like to introduce our panel. First of all, as I mentioned, Chris Reed, the um, um, Ontario Cycling Chair. Then Jim Crosscombe is the Ontario Cycling Executive Director. We're going to hear from him next. Next, I'd like to introduce John Wilkinson, a partner with the legal firm of Weirfolds LLP. Brent Badham, Vice President of Sport and Recreation for Gallup. Then we have Kevin Jones from Odyssey Medical. We also have Dr. Janet McMorty, sports and family physician and associate medical director also from Odyssey Medical. Um, and finally, Glenn Maywissa, owner of Pulse Racing. So with that, uh, Jim Crosscombe, I turn it over to you. Can you get us started with some of what's been going on um, during this COVID pandemic? Thanks, PJ. I'll start with this slide here where I just want to show a little bit of a timeline of what's been going on in terms of COVID-19 restrictions. March 17th, Ontario entered full lockdown with the emergency orders issued, emergency measures issued by our government. And that proceeded to saw a halt to all of our cycling activities, as it turns out, for the entire season. We saw a reopening phase as we went into August and there was expanded opportunities for cycling. And here we are in December, December 17th, nine months after the restrictions were full lockdown in March. 
we've got a whole new set of guidelines. There's lockdowns and restrictions by region. And it's a pretty confusing landscape looking forward. There is opportunity, but we have to figure out where we can best utilize the opening up procedures that we anticipate the government uh, in, their, in their criteria as we move forward. There's been two consistent restrictions throughout. Maintain a two meter distance and gathering limits. And this plays into every single government regulation and legislation that we have seen. And it's important that we understand this because this is the context of any discussion I've had with the government, gone through our sport consultants, whenever we've talked to them about where, when exemptions were permitted, what we might and might not be able to do. Two meters, gathering size. And you can see today with the way the restrictions and the, and the, and the reopening plan is, is, is outlined, that's exactly where the primary concern is in every stage. The COVID-19 response framework. This is a document put out by the provincial government. It's updated, at least in the last uh, two months, this has been the guiding document. It's updated on a semi-regular basis and we will be guided by this document. It covers the regional health and safety measures, the sector specific and safety measures outlined in the document. We're all familiar with the zones of public health measures. They're in the news every single day. And these are, this is a snapshot of where we are today, showing all the public health regions. And uh, you can see where we are at the moment. We publish a document called the Progressive Return to Cycling Guidelines. It's on our website throughout the summer, since March, it's been updated on a regular basis. And it's our guide for the return to sanctioned and approved activities. And it's created through compliance with provincial regulations, legal guidance, insight from health and safety, medical experts, insurance advice, constant interaction with peer groups in Ontario and across the country and relevant published guidelines relating to the sport of cycling. Let me catch up on my notes here on my desk too. Um, there have been questions regarding distancing while on group rides. And that's why I've put this slide up here it's from Toronto Public Health. And throughout every document, we have been consistent with public health advice. And it's up here for a simple reason is because it's always questioned. Can we be one meter? Do we have to be two meters? Can we group right in a different pattern? So we did receive a number of questions on this, but I just wanted to post this up there as a starting point for our discussion, because it is the common observation in all jurisdictions while riding a bicycle in Ontario jurisdictions, six feet or two meters is the separation among cyclists. You know, it's uh, thanks for all of that, Jim. And just to remind our audience that we've received um, several questions relating to the current guidelines. And, um, you know, I'm going to intersperse these questions throughout the presentation. And let's start with this question. Many believe that outdoor cycling is at a low risk of transmission. Uh, why has the OCA continued to maintain the two meter requirements? And I'm looking for sort of a couple of answers. The first one I'm going to go to is for John, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that. Sure, thank you and good evening. Um, the two meter requirement, uh, as Jim's indicated, uh, flows through all the legislation. Um, and the legislation also indicates that public health directives, um, guidance from the local public health unit, from Ontario Public Health, all of these have to be followed as well. And the two meter requirement is omnipresent. There are a couple of statutory exceptions um, and they relate to um, uh, basically 
contact sports that are team sports. And also uh, they relate to uh, specific situations where training is not possible without somebody being um, closer than two meters to the uh, athlete. And those um, exceptions in general wouldn't apply to uh, recreational or other cycling. So um, the two meter rule is the general rule uh, legally. And um, there's also, of course, the medical aspect. And I'll turn it back uh, or over to uh, um, others for that commentary. You know what, thank you, John, for that. And and you're absolutely right. We're now gonna put Kevin and or Janet on the hot seat to speak about this very same question, but from a medical standpoint. Awesome, thanks PJ and good evening, everyone. I'm gonna take first stab, I'm gonna punt it over to Janet really quickly because she is much smarter than I. I think <laughs> one of the big challenges, of course, in the cycling community, because I've been around it for a long enough time, is the compliance, right? How do we ensure and enforce compliance of a two meter rule in a sport that moves faster than most people can observe? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges from an operator and, a, and an event perspective is how do you guarantee, how do you maintain it? And when you've got a sport that naturally has a positioning issue that people want to be close to each other for various reasons, how do you enforce that? So I think it makes for an operational challenge and the medical evidence at this stage, even though it can be challenged, two meters is the, is still being perceived as the sort of golden expectation. So over to Janet. Uh, yeah, I think kind of uh, bouncing off what both of you have said, you know, also it's kind of unlikely that a health department can come up with specific guidelines for specific people, specific port sports. You know, it's based on a broader, easier to follow context for people. Um, you know, there have been some arguments from some of the other doctors involved in cycling that actually two meters is not enough for a sport like cycling. You're actually at an increased risk on a group ride. I mean, we can fight and debate a lot about that, but, you know, distancing is based on being at rest, right? Two meters is actually a broad concept about how far a sneeze travels as opposed to how far a person travels into it. So say if you're on a bike, um, two meters trying to peloton yourself, the bike in front of you, if you sneeze or, you know, try and blow your nose, it's going to fly behind you and the person who's two meters behind you is there right there pretty quick. Um, so, you know, actually there has been some arguments that two meters isn't quite enough for a sport like road cycling. Well, let's uh, move on for a second. And, and other sports have been able to waive the distancing rules during active participation. Why hasn't cycling been able to do so? And John, that's a question for you. Uh, sure. Um, so it goes back to the um, general legislative and public health approach of the, um, uh, the two meter distancing. Um, there are not exemptions based on particular sports in the legislation. Um, the exceptions are general and broad, and I've mentioned them. Um, and they relate to, as I say, contact sports that are uh, team sports, where the team sport contact sport rules have been modified to um, allow the players to avoid contact just not an applicable type of exception for cycling. Um, and the other very, very limited uh, exception is related, as I said, to the um, uh, where an individual needs training um, uh, assistance uh, for safety, basically. But even there, of course, um, whereas the distancing isn't required, all other um, uh, health related um, protection should be implemented, uh, PPE and the like, in order to minimize the risk of, uh, of COVID spread. You know, while I have you, John Wilkinson, I am going to ask another question, and that is, what is the legal responsibility um, of an organization under the current legislation, um, because I know there's a whole lot to cover, including that Bill 218. So if you could walk us through that, I'd be grateful. Okay, um, so I don't want to spend too much time on all of this, which a lawyer is uh, able to do. Um, but I will say that um, sports stakeholders, cycling stakeholders, 
have to look at a number of sources of legal obligations and I'll give you a list of, of uh, those. First of all, you have to look at the law and all the, um, the regulations that relate to the current situation. It was initially under the emergency management uh, statute and then July 24th, believe it or not, the emergency ended. Uh, hmm. Hard to believe that it was that long ago. And then we got into the reopening phase. So believe it or not, again, we're in the reopening phase and all the regulations uh, moved over onto the reopening statute at that time. Uh, but the regulations basically just went under a new statute. It was the same principle, the same approach in general. Those laws lead to the second crucial uh, aspect that people have to comply with as um, cycling stakeholders. And I've said it already, but you have to comply with public health authority directives. Uh, Jim's mentioned the response framework that emanates from health. Uh, that's a crucial aspect, but it drills down below that. Um, the local public health unit, let alone province-wide guidelines, the local public health unit has the ability to issue advice, recommendations, instruction on any aspect of physical distancing, cleaning, disinfecting, all, all these safety measures, and they have to be complied with according to the law. There's, that is part of the statutory regime. So um, those are two initial elements. Then you get down to the very localized uh, legal obligations and practical obligations. The first being the rules of the facility in which you're um, working uh, or uh, having your activity. And in the cycling scenario, you have to consider what is the facility, which is an issue that I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. There are some cycling facilities, but there are also situations where uh, you're not inside a facility, you're in an outdoor activity. The way the law has approached that is it has focused on the person responsible for the place, the business or the facility, broad terms that make an individual responsible for an activity. And uh, while the wording in the legislation is not specific uh, to, uh, to address, for example, public roads, the application of the law is such that those who are responsible for enforcing it will find a person responsible for an event. And you have to consider that when you're organizing an event or considering uh, organizing an event or for OCA's point of view, sanctioning an event. So the appropriate uh, risk management, risk averse um, way to look at things is that you can't skirt the rules by being cute on the analysis of um, the situation you're in. Three more uh, aspects that I'll just mention quickly. The first is that you can't forget the importance, and Brent will talk on it in a few minutes, of what your insurance and your insurer feels about the activity you're undertaking. It is um, a mugs game to uh, ha have an event where insurance doesn't cover and the big issue is that COVID coverage is one thing, uh, virtually impossible to get uh, or have, but if you are engaging in an illegal activity, none of your insurance uh, will um, work or cover. So you have to be um, prudent in determining whether or not you're conducting a legal activity because otherwise insurance won't cover. The last two, um, OCA has its own rules uh, and its own return to sport rules based on all the rest of the ones I've mentioned, um, but they have to be abided by. And then finally, safety. Uh, you have to just sit back when you've applied all the rest of the rules and think is what is being contemplated actually gonna be safe for all participants and all stakeholders. So that's just an overarching uh, commonsensical approach. I don't want to belabor it, but I want to cover uh, one other aspect that's important uh, now. In a very positive way, 
uh, particularly looking forward as uh, reopening uh, gains pace, hopefully. The province has introduced uh, what was originally called Bill 218, but is now called the Supporting Ontario's Recovery Act 2020. And to bore you with a bit, little bit of legalese, but it's very important, this act provides immunity for those who uh, properly conduct activities and the immunity is from a claim with respect to COVID-19 infection. Uh, so I'll just read this quickly from the uh, explanatory note for the, uh, the statute. No cause of action arises against any person as a direct or indirect result of an individual being or potentially being infected with or exposed to COVID-19 on or after March 17th as a direct or indirect result of an act or omission of the person if. So immunity, but then there's the ifs. At the relevant time, the person acted or made a good faith effort to act in accordance with two things. And this harkens back to what I've already mentioned. The first, public health guidance. So if you haven't shown a good faith effort to act in accordance with public health guidance and you haven't got evidence of that, uh, you won't have the benefit of this immunity. Secondly, you have to comply with all federal, provincial, or municipal law. So all that I mentioned earlier, you have to comply with it. And then there's a kicker. There's an exception. You can do that. You can show good faith efforts. You can have records to show all that. But if it is determined that you uh, were grossly negligent in what you did, uh, then the coverage or the immunity is not there. It is virtually impossible, I think, for someone who has shown a good faith effort to follow those uh, public health guidelines and laws to be grossly negligent. So that's the good news. But one final note, if you're ever going to rely on this immunity, you have to have the records to show that you made the good faith effort. You can't just say you did. So those who are involved moving forward with organizing events, keep good records and uh, comply with the laws as I've mentioned them. So I'll stop there and there may be questions later. Thank you. You know, John, that's great. And it's all very good information. And imagine there being a kicker in a year like 2020, which has been the kicker of all years, honestly. Um, I'd like to move on to Brent Batham, who is going to hopefully be able to address some of the insurance implications. Uh, Brent, over to you. Uh, thank you, PJ. And uh, speaking of kickers, um, the insurance has certainly been one as well uh, during 2020. Um, and uh, Thank you, John, for the primer, as you touched on a lot of what I'm going to talk about there. Uh, you've clearly heard me talk about this subject before. Uh, so effectively, the COVID pandemic has tossed an already volatile insurance market into um, complete chaos. And how the sport insurance market has uh, overwhelmingly decided they're going to respond to the COVID pandemic is that they simply aren't and uh, they are just excluding it from coverage. And so how we've seen that done is as uh, sports have had their insurance policies come up for renewal, there have been uh, contagion or communicable disease or COVID specific exclusions uh, added to the policy. Now this is where cycling got a little bit fortunate is because uh, the cycling insurance program is up for renewal on January 1st and January 1st, 2020, um, you know, COVID hadn't hit North America yet. And so they were able to avoid the exclusion for the 2020 term, uh, but it's absolutely coming as an exclusion for 2021. So for the 2021 cycling season, uh, you're not gonna be able to rely on insurance to protect you from COVID claims. Uh, so what does that mean? Where do we go from here? Cause you know, we still need to have cycling and we still need to find a way to have events. And uh, bill 218 is going to obviously be a big factor in that, but without the insurance protection there, risk management and doing everything in your power to mitigate your exposure uh, becomes so important and so crucial uh, to really have this nailed down and really um, have this as a focus. So first and foremost, you got to make sure you're following public health guidelines 
And you have to make sure that you're obeying the law. Uh, because as John mentioned, even in 2020, when there wasn't this COVID exclusion, if you're breaking the law, you void your insurance coverage. And that goes for COVID claims, that goes for bodily injury claims, that goes for any type of claim. Um, a very standard exclusion on all liability policies is a legal acts exclusion. So if you're breaking the law, you do not have insurance for what you were doing. Um, so being absolutely be sure to be following legal guidelines, be following public health guidelines, um, are absolutely important. And then, as John mentioned, there is this Bill 218 protection, uh, which partially came out of trying to solve the insurance problem is uh, part of the thought process that went into drafting that legislation. Um, but there is that gross negligence caveat that you can still, you know, be found uh, liable and uh, have to deal with that if you are grossly negligent. So preemptively building that defense and preemptively building that case that you acted in good faith and weren't grossly negligent is also going to be incredibly important. So being able to document that you are following the law and following public health guidelines is important, but what can also certainly help and what is also going to be important is following return to sport guidelines. And that includes making sure your event is sanctioned and approved by Ontario Cycling. Um, Ontario Cycling has return to play protocols uh, that are and as uh, Jim's already talked about, are taking into consideration health guidelines. So if your uh, event is sanctioned and approved by Ontario Cycling, that is part of the case to build that you've been acting in good faith and that you've been doing everything you can to, um, uh, to, follow, uh, to follow the rules that you're supposed to be following. Um, so the real takeaways from this are because you can't rely on insurance to have your back, you need to have your own and you need to have your own before you have the event. Um, by doing everything you can and documenting everything that you've done uh, to try to keep your athletes safe uh, uh, from this disease. You know what, Brent? It is always uh, wonderful to hear you speak because you you make it easy for us to understand about insurance. Now, I'm going to swing back to John Wilkinson for a second and say to him, careful what you wish for, because you wanted questions and we've got some questions. Um, can you define good faith effort, please? It's a great question from the audience. Sure. Um, so I'm going to uh, refer to the statute again and then make three comments about it. Um, the reference to the statute is that it does uh, define good faith effort in uh, one of its provisions. And it says that a good faith effort includes an honest effort, whether or not that effort is reasonable. So that's what it says, an honest effort, whether or not that effort is reasonable. The three comments that I'll make are that that's inclusive. It's not okay. a, a comprehensive definition. So there may be other types of good faith effort you can show, but honesty seems to be a component of it. Uh, the second is it's gotta be in the context of what you're making a good faith effort to do. So you have to remember you're trying to follow public health guidelines or guidance and also uh, obey all laws. So whatever you're doing, honestly, it's got to relate to that compliance. And the, the third point is, uh, and I'm echoing uh, Brent, but um, you don't want to be arguing in front of uh, any kind of uh, um, court that um, you were honestly trying to do something if you don't have the evidence or the records to support your argument. So. I, I just can't uh, um, emphasize enough that record keeping is crucial. And as Brent said, some of the best pieces of evidence are that your event has been sanctioned and insured. Thank you. Here's your next question. Um, it's regarding event size versus gathering size. Events were capped this summer at 100 riders, but the venue was also hosting larger groups of general public and tourists. How does this factor into the laws as written? John, can you comment? So I will just say in general that um, over the last few months, in particular the summer, uh, there was what I would say some um, inventive interpretation of uh, what a facility encompassed. Um, there were uh, situations where I believe that 
uh, facility operators, and I don't know to what this refers to, but in some sports and some uh, situations, facility operators would consider um, one portion of their property to be um, allocated to a particular event and another portion to another event. Um, and, and they would um, try to apportion things. That may or may not have succeeded in certain situations because another element of the rules, and this is based on public health, is that, and we know it from retail, all of us, that there are rules regarding square footage and the ability to distance within particular areas. So um, gathering sizes applied for some uh, rules where there were absolute number limitations. In other situations like retail, there have been um, over time restrictions and particularly in the summer restrictions based on square footage. So uh, there were a variety of things at, at, at hand. And as I say, I think in some situations there were some inventive interpretations of what was permissible. Okay, thank you for, for clearing that up. Um, we're gonna move on now. Um, and one of the things that we're gonna talk about is the focus on Strava segments or personal challenge rides has never been higher as clubs and teams struggle to stay relevant to its membership base while it's still ensuring physical distancing guidelines and public gathering allowances are being followed. So um, has there been any consideration to sanctioning these types of activities or events Jim, I'm going to turn that to you. Okay. I'm going to answer both the question and the follow-up, uh, hopefully okay. in, the same, in the same here. Most definitely. We definitely consider this. However, after coming up with some initial thoughts on how this could work and checking with our legal and insurance and other channels, the advice we received was that remote management of events is a potential liability risk. Sitting at your desk, watching people ride around and not knowing if they're safe, if they've been injured, or there's a situation on the road um, is a liability risk. Once you close your Strava section, your club might do something and it's a Strava section that's open for a couple of days. I understand it potentially could be open for a longer period of time. So you might have people who are not part of your group also riding on that uh, particular section. And I think what's quite important is we have received more requests this year and our promise is to continue to research this and see if there is a solution that does work. And maybe it's a little bit of, there is a Strava section, but there's some remote, there's some on-site management and things like that. Cause that was our concept last year is we went to on-site management for events. Can you talk a little bit about uh, this past season and numerous cycling events in Quebec, um, uh, very few in Ontario, and how were they able to host those events? And is this an insurance uh, issue or government regulation issue? And is there a way to remove this barrier in 2021? And while I have you, outside of the above example, what are the other provinces doing? Jim. Going to well, go back to you. This is a this is a tough question, and and I understand why people are asking this. At the present time, I don't see any way for the province to permit a similar event in Ontario. Okay. And it's even tougher, in the sense that there's no exemptions from the regulations permitted at the time at the present time and for the foreseeable future. And I think once again, we have to go back to should the situation change, we will explore all opportunities. Okay. No other province apart from an island bubble of PEI was able to run events of this nature. And yes, BC did run two events late summer, but events like that were shut down pretty quickly. The total number of events that were run that weren't physically distanced is in the minority for the majority of the provinces. And I think we have to just rely on the fact that there, there was a table, a sport table through our, our ministry where we could talk about these things. They would help us to a certain extent how we might couch a request. <coughs> but the strong recommendation at all times was physical distancing and gathering size. And we could never figure out a way to overcome that burden. 
it's a moot point now because the exemption request for process has been shut down and there's 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 no no no, no one knows when that might open up again the um I think the other thing that happened was, I, I think I, if, if it did open up, it was shut down pretty quickly in the other provinces. And that would be BC, Manitoba, and Alberta. Saskatchewan, I think had similar restrictions to us. So Jim, can, just before we jump into again, what other provinces are doing, can I maybe pass the ball to Brent? Um, Brent, um, can you talk to me a little bit about this as an insurance issue? Uh, certainly, uh, I mean, Quebec, um, from an insurance and legal standpoint is a bit of a unicorn province. Um, they do have a different legal system in Quebec than we do uh, in Ontario and the rest of the country has. Uh, and Sport Quebec has a insurance program for the Quebec PSOs that is designed around that uh, unique legal system that they have. Um, I can't claim to be uh, particularly knowledgeable about what has gone on with that Quebec uh, insurance program from a COVID perspective, um, perspective. I don't know for sure whether or not a COVID exclusion was added to it. I would imagine that it was uh, because it's with AIG who's been adding it to everything else. So um, I would imagine that that Quebec uh, insurance program does also have a COVID exclusion. Um, having a COVID exclusion on your insurance policy doesn't mean that you can't run insured events. It just means those events aren't going to be covered for COVID related claims. But uh, as we know, um, there's a lot of other things that can happen at a cycling event that you need insurance coverage for. So um, I would imagine um, that Quebec cycling events uh, likely didn't have uh, COVID coverage, um, but we're probably able to get around uh, legal barriers uh, to like the legal barriers of having an event and therefore still have uh, the general liability coverage for uh, injuries in crashes. I think, I think it's important to note that uh, unlike many provinces, we have spent a lot of time, had a lot of face time with our minister, Lisa. Uh, uh, and I think what's important is, is some of the things that we did do worked. There certainly was a, a movement to lobby hard for the, for the, for the changes to the um, COVID liability and, and exemptions from it. And that did work. It wasn't all on sport. It was also also was a good thing to do. Um, we started to see, as things opened up going into August, where a lot of the discussions that were had in open forums started to see some incremental change. It it never got to the point where we would likely have had an approval for events similar to Quebec, and as you all know, the curve went back up rapidly to where we are today. So. It's unfortunate, and I think we have to be prepared to go again when things open up in terms of exemptions. If, if that exemption is appropriate and it fits the other things that we've talked about here today, is it, is it correct for us to do that? And is it from an insurance and legal perspective the things that we should do? And I guess we have to wait a little while before we can do that. But we're committed to anything and everything that will help us get back to normal with our sport. Can I just jump in with a great audience question about precedent? Um, have there been examples of organizations that have been found liable for COVID infections? I'm assuming that goes to John, but maybe there's a little soup song of Brent in there as well. Well, I can start. Um, it's, although we've had uh, nine plus months of this, it's early days from a legal perspective uh, for claims to go through the system. Um, and now, as um, you've seen from Bill 218, uh, there are some roadblocks for those uh, claims moving forward. Uh, so I am not aware of any uh, concluded claims, um, it, certainly in Canada, um, with respect to uh, COVID liability. Um, on that score, I'll note that BC um, had an immunity statute before um, Ontario did, although it's a more limited uh, statute. Um, the uh, period within which a claim can be brought for most um, matters uh, in most Canadian jurisdictions is two years after you become aware of the, that the claim exists. So the limitation period is still running on, the, on all of these potential claims. Um, and finally, I will note that Legal risk is one thing and precedence of um, 
uh, legal liability will be interesting should they um, uh, arise. But the most or the more immediate risk for organizations, for uh, institutions, for businesses, I think is reputational risk. And okay. that's extremely important for um, those who are running events um, uh, or sanctioning events. Do you want to be seen uh, or do you want your judgment or reputation to be questioned because you've enabled an event that somebody somewhere decides should be called a super spreader? You know what? Fair enough. Brent, do you have anything to add? Uh, all I will add is, um, you know, agreement with John. I work with over 40 uh, PSOs and NSOs across the country, and none of my clients have been sued over a COVID-related issue. Um, so that doesn't mean they won't. Again, it's early, and a lot of lawsuits come in, uh, you know, years after the alleged incident, um, often kind of exactly two. And um, But no, we haven't seen any claims. I haven't heard of any claims uh, coming in. Uh, and uh, echo John's on reputational risk. Those insurance products do exist. Uh, they are very pricey though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, Jim, is there anything else you'd like to add with uh, uh, your awareness of what other provinces are doing across the country? That, that's it, thank you. Okay, terrific. Then let's turn our attention to 2021 events. Uh, can you speak to um, what you're considering? I think there's a lot of optimism as we look forward into 2021. We don't really know 100% how this season is gonna play out, but we have plenty of options to work with. And so far in working with the organizers and discussing opportunities, options, variations on themes, there is definitely some enthusiasm to meet that end, events in 2021. So that's what we've got to look forward to. We don't quite know how it's gonna roll out, but there's a few things to consider. We've got, online events in the winter, right in our homes. As the season warms up, there's always the opportunity for local activities. And it's club driven in that case. Clubs provide activities for their members. And if that was a case where you couldn't travel, you couldn't go anywhere, you've still got your local club and you, you gather and participate as the measures allow. Regional, if we have a region, maybe a couple of clubs, maybe enough athletes that want to participate in something, we could look at having something in a region. And that would be when all travel is discouraged as it is right now. As things open up, and once again, don't forget, there's five stages. We go from lockdown to green. So there's all kinds of opportunity. And we have examples of this throughout the province, although some of those green areas were probably up at the North Pole on that chart I showed you. But as we start to grow a little and we get not grow so much as we open up into regions. So there's a couple of regions that are in, in, a, in a particular zone and travel isn't discouraged. There's no reason why an event couldn't happen that combines some areas, some clubs and some athletes. And of course, what we really desire is our mass start events. And they can be permitted as we're allowed. And of course the pivot to normal is, is kind of the same thing as our mass starts. And Part of what we're trying to do here is ensure that we've got an event that, let's say it's a mountain bike individual start, if the circumstances are appropriate, that event could pivot to mass start, providing we're allowed to. So I think there's different things that are going to happen this year, and there's a, there's a good, good opportunity for us to cycle competitively and have, have healthy activities. We just have to be prepared for a lot of eventualities. And where we are today in December is not where we're gonna be in March or April or even June. We just can't quite predict it yet. And our organizers are more than capable of handling the challenge where they can to pivot to a different level of event, more participants. Um, and if the two meter rule disappeared, we, we can go to mass starts. So I think there's lots of opportunity ahead. You know what, that's great. Can you talk a little bit about sort of um, um, the events, um, you know, sanction, lower membership, you've got all kinds of things going on that are helping you to make those decisions. So um, if there's any more detail you could share, that would be great. Absolutely. I think 2021 events, when we, when we start talking what we can't do, it's not a good conversation. And sometimes okay. we can't do what we want to do. 
So I think what we have to do is look forward to the things that meet the guidelines where we are today, whether it be green or red, and move forward with ideas. And what we're going to do is we're going to ensure that events are sanctioned with lower membership requirements so that we can not require a UCI license for events and things like that. So a citizen permit level allowance for all non-national sanctioned events. And of course, there's categories at national sanctioned events that could qualify for this, this sort of uh, sanction as well. We have to have the ability to grow and pivot as measures change. And that's a specific burden on an organizer because not all events can pivot quickly. Road events, it could take three months to get permits in normal times. So if you've got an individual, a time, a time trial on the road, it might not be really easy to pivot to a regular mass start road race. I'm, I'm, I know I'm using the time trial example, but the desire would be a mass start road event in a normal year and we're running a time trial because of COVID times. Some good examples of events for 2021. Individual start, mountain bike, gravel and marathon. We've already making progress in, in most of those areas. ITT on the road or gravel or wherever. We're making, we're starting to make good progress with ITTs on the road. Individual start team relay is one suggestion that has come forward. Two up physically distant rider races, multi-lap or short track. This was what was in place for cyclocross in last fall before organizers started pulling the plug because of traveling, uh, concerns over traveling and, and, and rates of COVID increasing. So these are some just some examples. And I think if people have example or ideas of what might meet safety guidelines or health guidelines, we're all ears. We'd love to hear, we'd love to see how we can facilitate it. And we have some experience with events from this last year on, on some of the safety concerns. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides, some examples, and then um, one specific event that went forward and with great success. There is so much to talk about when we're talking about events, especially when there is so much um, that we're unsure of. So, you know, as you're walking us through this process, um, one of the things that I, I, I think we should talk about are sort of the con considerations um, of the calendar. Like, what did you have to think about when you were uh, trying to come up with a calendar? In a normal year, calendar creation is, is, is an impossible challenge. Okay. International events, national events, provincial events, uh, anchor events, um, things like that. So last year we saw as of, uh, I believe it was a couple of days before the emergency orders, everything started collapsing on us. Organizers, very rightfully so, said, we're just not going to run events. So what we had was cascading cancellations all season long. And it's frustrating. And we couldn't replace them. But I think what we can do that is positive is we're going to have a primary calendar made up of events that can meet COVID protocols. And these are individual start events. And of course, if the times are right, we pivot. And they'll have a low probability of cancellation. It relies on what state a region is and the measures that are being applied. So if something changes or something doesn't change, there's going to be an impact there. But it's a low probability of cancellation. And then a secondary calendar of mass start events. Because a lot of our organizers do, this is their bread and butter. This is what they want to do. They're not necessarily as interested in individual start events. And it's challenging to, 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 to maybe do that in COVID times. So two calendars. COVID compliant calendar, hopefully minimal cancellations, a secondary calendar where there may be some restriction driven cancellations. Lots to think about. So let's talk a little bit about 2020 and the individual start events that did happen. Can you run through that? It's, it, it certainly wasn't the biggest year for events that we've ever had. We finished our track season and then you know one or two weeks later we're, we were into lockdown. But there was three individual start events in 2020. Pulse Racing's eight hour, Mountain View Enduro, and the Hardwood Ski and Bikes Weekly Cycle Cross. All very successful events under strict COVID protocols. And in all of our surveys we did this year, these events have been mentioned time and time again. I never thought I'd like this sort of event. I am so appreciative that these events went forward. We should consider this next year. And that's from the heart 
and, and intended for non-COVID times as well as COVID times. So I think what we saw was a start. And it was good to work with these organizers because we all started to learn what COVID protocols are, how we had to protect our, our event, the event staff, the event managers, and our participants. This was not an easy learning curve. And the COVID burden is fairly high on an organizer. So three events, lots of learning. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to hear from one of our organizers who ran an event last year. And there's a number of questions that PJ is going to ask so that we can maybe learn a little bit about what happened. And it truly was an exciting event and it had a great turnout. You know what? We're going to turn the corner then and we're going to go right to Glenn Maywasa to talk um, about, about this very thing. So, um, Glenn, can you speak to the structure of this Pulse Racing eight hour event? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I guess one of the first things I want to say is that this was a, it was meant as a, basically a test, like a test concept. It wasn't meant as, oh, this is a perfect thing to do. And it went through many permutations as we dreamed about different things and, and, uh, and also working with Ontario Cycling with what, what's allowed and how we can make it happen and everything. So, so that was appreciated. Um, and the point was to learn from it. And we learned a lot from it. Um, some good things and some bad things, some other things that we would do. So um, I think I'll, I'll start with the online registration because that was sort of in my thought process of doing this is one is we wanted to make it as low risk for everybody as possible being, and I mean low risk, financially risk for both the participants and for us. So one is we first put out the concept of the event and saying, hey, this is the concept that we're looking at. And we put that out to our, our regular people and it got put out through OCA. And then we said, hey, if this, looks good and we you know we basically put it out as kind of sort of like you know raising a, uh, a, a test balloon and if we didn't get any big negative off from it and we said okay we're going to open entry at a certain point which was very late from when we would typically open an entry um and we made it clear that there would be limits on per day so this is when entry is going to open these are going to be the limits so if you have a particular day you want you're going to have to get your entry in quickly and also one thing we, we did is we structured it so our overhead was extremely low you know by not having awards people would pre-order their own t-shirts so we basically said okay how can we do it to keep our overhead as low as possible but then we also guarantee people re full refund so if the event had to get canceled because of change in restrictions that we would do a full refund so we you know less a small admin fee that's our online fee um so we kept it basically risk-free for people that oh if i paid you know 40 bucks to do this thing that i would get a refund or mostly get a refund if it got canceled because of covid so let me um, ask you, how was the idea received before we start talking a bit more about event management and COVID times, which were complicated, but how was the idea I think received? It was re well, it was, again, it was, uh, it was received with a lot of questions, first of all, because it was it's something completely different. Um, there was a lot of people who, who I think it just wasn't for them. Like it just, like this didn't float their boat and it's not what they wanted. And that's okay. fine. Like we can't do a mass start event. Normally we would have 800 people there. We can't do that. We're limited to hundred per day. We spread it out over 14 days. Um, so it, yeah, there's some people that just didn't do it. There were some people who did it. I think they entered kind of, um, you know, with a lot of questions and well, we'll just give it a shot. And I think that overall, like after the event, it was, it was very well received for most, for 99% of the people had a great time, um, really liked it. We got lots of good feedback on it. We also got, we also learned a lot of things from people as well. So, so that was good. Cause that was, and, and uh, we like, we didn't, once the, rent, the event started running, we didn't have to change much, but we did change some things like right up until the day of the, of the event and how we, how we were gonna handle things. And, and actually there was a small change even halfway through when there was a new directive and we had to sort of go, okay, how do we deal with this new directive? And it was having to be on one of the Saturdays and Jim got the call at one o'clock when the premier made an announcement. So um, yeah, it was, it was received well. The format of it was in, it was a, an individual start, and people basically had a start window between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. to start their eight hours, and they basically they self timed. It was honor system, um, and we so we basically checked everybody in in the morning, physically distanced, very like virtually no contact, um, and they just decided when they want to start. They started their Garmin, their watch, or whatever, 
they did their 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 event like their, it was basically a personal challenge it wasn't so much a race and then we had a, a a portal where they could upload their own results that became basically a a, a running results page over the two weeks so um yeah the start wasn't managed it wasn't a managed start it was like okay. manage your own start right that's then that was it and we basically had um a no touch protocol so there wasn't a baton to you know transfer between people relaying we told them we didn't even want them to high five like you basically you just ride through the next person goes so you don't do any kind of touch any kind of handoff um, making sure people were, were distanced in the area and then we set up all the stuff as far as uh, like where the lineups are. We had, you know, six feet distancing. We had if people had to wear masks when they weren't, uh, when they were in the area. We had dedicated porta potties that were cleaned every day. Um, we had hand sanitizer stations all around. Um, so yeah, that was that was most of the stuff. And you know, to John's point earlier, uh, we actually documented all that. So <laughs> took pictures of everything. And the other thing is like about four or five times per day, we made announcements over the PA system that just reminding people of the protocol that there were some people that came as groups, um, like their own little small, you know, uh, bubble or whatever you want to call it, because those were allowed at that time, but to make sure that people didn't mix bubbles. So if they had a club that had four or five riders in one club that they weren't mixing or having a beer with the other club, and if we saw that happening, we either addressed it or over the PA or just addressed it personally. And people were, were actually awesome. People were really, really good as far as- I have know. a quick question for you. Two quick questions. One is, what was the most surprising um, bit of feedback that you received? The most surprising was that people wanted us to do the same format next year or in future years, whether there was COVID or not. Uh, oh. A lot of people, like when you have, like um, we would have say 200 to 220 people in a, in a mass start um on a typical year and and it's a lot of you know it's jostling it's a lot of traffic um in the day there's any at any one time there's 200 people on course over a 10k course there's a lot of traffic and passing and different speeds and people love that it was very low volume there was virtually no passing um that there was no jostling so for people who are newer to the sport they loved it because they didn't have the the aggression that you can get in in normal races so they said they would they would actually like that format and and actually i i what i learned from that is in in um the, the nordic countries when they have these big loppets they might have twenty thousand people go on the saturday as the race day but they quite often what they have called challenge days leading up to it so we'll have a, a seniors day or a youth day or a women's day and it's they they ski the same course they get timed but it's not considered the race day because one is they can't handle that number of people on race day because it's so popular, but two, that they don't have the aggression and they just start whenever they want to start. And then because it's chip time and they get timed and they get their name up and some kind of results. Um, so I'm actually looking for future years saying, hey, on a Thursday, Friday, we could run a challenge format when people want to come to this sort of lower level of, of event and, and less aggressive, less racy and still have the race on, on a weekend day. And it's, it's actually something we're looking for even for next year. If we, even if we have the hundred person limits, we could do, say, one of the Saturdays is the solo tag team race day. The Sunday is the four-person team race day. And then midweek are this sort of personal challenge day, whether it be team or solo or tag team. And we can split the results like that. Um, the other thing I learned from it is people actually want to be timed. The, the self-timing concept, even for the people that are less um, you know, worried about racing, still would like to be timed. And it's something we're looking at for next year with a pretty simple chip timing system, we could actually hand them a chip um, and then they use that chip through the day and then they deposit the chip, we sanitize them. If we have a number of um, different sequences of chips, we can have a couple days between chips being used and sanitized. So that's one thing I think that we would look at sort of doing as an improvement over next year. Um, so yeah. One final question, question, which is uh, top three tips for other organizers who might be looking to do the same thing. Top three. Uh, I think one is addressing the refund issue right up front because a lot of people are sitting on a lot of entries. Myself, I'm sitting on entries from events that I entered for twenty uh, for 2020 that didn't happen. And yeah, I get a credit to future years and blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, so I think having a very clear refund policy versus just we're just going to hang on to your money forever. Um, I think that's one. Um, another tip. I would say 
<laughs> I don't know. I, like you got to be flexible. That's the, the hardest thing is you got to be willing. You got to be able to just shut it down. And, and that was the one thing that we looked at. And that's why this was purely a learning experience is like, and we, even when we're looking forward to 2021, it's like, okay, how do we do something and come up with a plan that's going to be okay if there's no interprovincial. So we can only do Simcoe because where we are, Simcoe Muskoka, if we can only do Simcoe Muskoka, how do we do that? Okay, then that's where our starting point. And if it's only 50, does that work? I don't know, maybe if it's only 100, does that work? Yeah, probably. If it's only 25, there's no way, right? So, so you have to come up with plan A is actually in sort of the worst scenario, scenario plan. Plan B is, well, maybe we can have 100 and we can actually get people from other regions, but not lockdown regions. Okay, how do we manage that? How do we have people identify where they're from and can they be involved? And then plan C is, well, things were like they were last year. Uh, we could have 100 and it didn't matter where they came from. How do we manage that? The reality of are we going to be back to mass start racing is probably a pipe dream. So um, maybe we'll that's, get there. that's tip two and three D all together. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing, Glenn. Such great information. Thank you so much for that. And keeping along with the uh, information about events, Jim, I'm going to pivot back to you um, and ask you this question. Will there be track and fat bike events in 2020-2021? Jim, I wonder if you're on mute, maybe? Someone has to be on mute while they're talking at least once during one of these things. <laughs> I'm glad it's not me. It's a nice uh, change. Uh, at this time, I believe our track season's in jeopardy. Okay. We're only allowed 10 participants total inside this facility. So between officials, timing, volunteers, it, it just will not work. We have plans if we, uh, if things change, the zones change or the measures change. We have plans for 50 and 100 participants uh, for individual uh, start events, but I, I, I'm not confident that we're gonna see that um, happen this winter. We can do this on short notice. The velodrome is not well booked at this point in time. Um, the fat bike events. So, I'm unaware of any applications for, strictly speaking, a, a standalone fat bike event. But I think what's really important is there are a number of events that are being talked about that do allow fat bikes. So from that perspective, I'm sure we'll see thing, some events that will incorporate a fat bike category. Okay. Now, what about the OCA and uh, developing a return to sport plan for the 2021 season? Um, how will this information be communicated? So I think... I think uh, it's not a specific 2021 document. It's a living document that okay. moves forward. It has, a, it has a, new, a different date when it's compiled as we have new information. Um, right now, that return to cycling guideline is missing some of the event formats that will be very likely in 2021. So we have a little bit of work to update it, but we haven't got to that final form with our organizers to say, this is exactly the sort of events that we're gonna be running. I think the club ITT format is in there and um, it's pretty solid. The updates were done as required and they're posted on our website. So there usually was a summary one pager that was put up there and then there's the core document. And of course now it's particularly confusing because there's five levels of, of measures in place there. So we, we've had to default to a lot of wording. Defer to your public health regions for further criteria. So it's it's not as comprehensive as it was in the summer because it was pretty obvious as one, one set of guidelines for us to follow. But it's on the website, it's updated as required and it will uh, continue to be updated as, as frequently as we, we need to. Okay. Um, is there going to be a date um, when it's going to be um, discussed for the whole or the part of the 2021 competitive cycling season, whether or not it'll be canceled? Like, is there a drop dead date for that? No, we don't have um, it's, it's it's we don't have anything set in stone. I think a okay. lot of it's going to be dialogue with our organizers. I, I think one of the questions we're going to ask, especially for the mass start events, is what is the window that you can operate under? So if we're in a in a, in a, in a with measures in a particular health region that doesn't permit it, and the event's six months out, there's hope for the event. 
we get down to three months, that might be the date where we're going to have to, the organizer is going to have to tell us, I just cannot produce this event if we pivot and mass start is allowed. So I think it'll be case by case and that those sort of events will be on the calendar that might have cancellations. So stay tuned. Definitely. Okay. Um, our next question actually has come up in our audience, but is also one that was uh, pre-submitted, and it's about vaccinations. Vaccinations are now likely to occur through uh, throughout 2021. The Ontario government has implied that proof of COVID-19 vaccine or an immunity, immunity passport could potentially be required. So here's the question, and it's going to go to John and also um, uh, Janet from our medical team here. Um, considering the inherent group nature of cycling and many standard cycling event formats, will the OCA require proof of COVID-19 vaccination in order to allow people to participate in sanctioned club activities or events? John, I'm gonna to go to you first. Thanks. Um, so I think there's uh, two aspects or two lenses through which you have to look at this. The first is the overarching government policy that is adopted with respect to vaccines and, and the idea of a vaccine passport. <clears throat> and, and from my perspective, we are just not there understanding how the federal, the provincial uh, governments are going to address that. And it leads into the second um, uh, lens. And that uh, lens, I think, is the privacy lens. <clears throat> the, um, and I use the, the word privacy in a very broad sense. Um, the idea of restricting people's activities based on their uh, immunization record um, is a very uh, important fundamental social decision. And uh, it has been made in some situations for, um, uh, for certain uh, vaccinations uh, in, in the context of certain activities like school. But uh, we all, I think, know that those are, are really, um, those were hard thought um, and careful decisions made. So um, I think that we have to see what happens and uh, the OCA and event organizers have to follow the lead of the government and then consider carefully uh, the impact on individuals of uh, any decision made uh, in that regard. So kind of a non-answer, wait and see, that's my view. Okay, and Dr. Janet McMorty, uh, from a medical point of view, can you speak to this vaccination question? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of a non-answer as well, too, because we just don't know a lot about it. I mean, we're just in the early stages of the rollout um, uh, that I've got lots of friends involved with in the medical, mu medical community. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll, we're just going to have to see. And as John said, this is a huge social, political um, issue that's gonna be interesting to see how it all works out. So I, I don't know, we, I don't think we have really an answer right now. Um, at okay. least I don't. It's still very new. I mean, we're still, everybody's trying to sort of figure things out, but um, Brent, can you talk about this same question from an insurance point of view? Uh, yes. Uh, the answer is that it doesn't really matter from an insurance standpoint because it's excluded from coverage. So, um, they don't get a say <laughs> because they're not okay. covering whether you're vaccinated or not. They're not covering those claims. So um, it's not an insurance uh, concern. Okay, fair enough. Um, we have come to the point where we've got about uh, 15 minutes left or so um, in this town hall. Um, we're gonna go to some questions from the floor. And the first one is, is sport different than other activities when it comes to numbers of people that can gather? Is cycling different mm -hmm. from other sports? And John, we're gonna start with you. Uh, so one aspect of cycling is that um, with some exceptions, it's generally conducted outdoors. So uh, the general distinction, as everybody knows, in gathering limits uh, during this period has been uh, um, between outdoor and indoor activities uh, and outdoor have um, uh, been allowed 
uh, larger gatherings. Um, the, uh, but there are no real sport specific uh, gathering rules. Um, there are uh, indoor, outdoor, um, not that it relates to um, very many uh, of us. There are some rules regarding a professional and Olympic level athletes, but um, beyond that, um, there's no sport specific distinctions. Okay, Glenn, you, uh, I've been told that you may have a bit of a perspective. Can you, can you talk to me a little bit about gathering size and about what other sports are potentially doing? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a negative thing, but um, maybe it was an update for people on the call. I, I'm very familiar and involved with Nordic skiing as well and, and racing. And um, as a sort of an FYI, basically the national federation and the provincial federation canceled all events for, for 2021. So that the season has been shot, uh, including right, right up in, in to including national championships, which were going to be held in March. Um, they had done a ton of work on trying to come up with individual, like a lot of Nordic racing is Nordic ski racing is individual start anyway. So it kind of fit that format really well, but they'd done a ton of work because it's harder to keep people outside all the time um, because it's cold and there's wax rooms and all these other things. They've done a lot of work on that, but what really sort of, uh, my understanding is, is what really killed it was the travel restrictions. So basically, if you've got areas in red zone or lockdown where people shouldn't be leaving those areas to either go into another lockdown or red zone area or go into a green area, then they didn't want to uh, sort of encourage that travel. The other thing with the Nordic ski events is most of them are two or three day events where people stay over in hotels, eat at restaurants, um, so that doesn't work. We're kind of fortunate, at least in, in, in Southern Ontario, where most people travel about two hours to go to a cycling event and it's outside all day and it's generally warm. Um, so you can, you can be outside the whole day. You don't need an indoor facility per se for your, your participants. Um, there is an issue around volunteers and timing. How do they you know, keep the physical distance and, and all that sort of thing? Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a big bummer for the ski world to hear that, but also I think, you know, to give them credit, they did a lot of work, but they also were very proactive in just saying, this is, is just not going to happen, seeing what's happening with, with the numbers. So I hope we're not there. I hope that come spring and, and early summer, things are turning around and we're able to get back to where we were this summer with creative events. Um, but that's just a bit of a perspective, um, that, you know, this isn't just a cycling issue. This, this the other sports are, are trying to go through the same thing. And there's a lot of smart people out there trying to figure this out that haven't been able to for other sports. And as you said, it's, it's winter sports, it's summer sports, it's uh, all kinds of other activities in between. Uh, we've got another really good question and it's about um, reconciling local clubs holding local activities given the, the distancing requirements for road gravel group rides. Um, can somebody provide some examples under current regulations that some clubs have taken? Jim, I'm gonna start with you and if anybody else wants to chime in, feel free to do so. Sorry, could you, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think um, that this person is looking for examples under current regulations that some clubs have taken um, that are um, still within uh, within the guidelines that have been recommended. It, or do you know of any sort of anecdotal um, examples from local clubs holding activities uh, that are still keeping you know that engagement with their membership? I, hmm. I, the um... My understanding is, is that clubs continue to ride. Many clubs continue to ride, many decided not to, but they, we provided some diagrams that showed maybe some, some different ways of riding with a appropriate distancing. They weren't the, uh, necessarily the law, um, but my understanding is some clubs have continued to, to do smaller 15 person rides, 10 person rides, maintaining physical distancing and have been quite successful doing it. It's not what this, how a, a normal ride would, would look because we all like to be behind someone's wheel and drafting and taking a turn at the front. So I, I don't think it's been particularly appealing, but I do believe a large number of clubs that, that decided to ride continue to do appropriately distance group rides. 
I've got another question that sort of relates to all of this. And I know that, you know, things are, are sort of evolving. And as we say in the business, we have to remain fluid in all of this. But um, can you talk to me a little bit about licenses? There are some people who believe that a COVID-19, um, that they are signing, uh, that with a license, they are receiving a COVID-19 exemption. Um, can you talk about the acknowledgement waiver and whether or not that is an exemption? I can... Oh, go ahead. I was, I was just saying, I could jump in and say um, <clears throat> those waivers uh, and um, acknowledgements of risk um, are what we call in the legal business risk allocation documents. So they, okay. um, an individual would sign such a document and uh, by doing that, acknowledge that the organizer of the event, the um, association sanctioning the event, the, fa the facility host, those people are not responsible for any uh, injury they might suffer. Uh, it is part of the risk management framework under which all provincial sport organizations and, uh, and clubs um, try or should try to operate. It goes hand in glove with insurance coverage and insurance coverage is often not there if those documents aren't in place or policies uh, related to them. So the bottom line is they allocate risk, they don't create exemptions. Okay. Um, so they're, those documents, uh, are, I don't think, or the approach in them is not useful as far as absolving anybody from failing to comply with the rules. You can't uh, say to an organizer, ignore the rules, I accept that risk. Uh, what you say is, we recognize that you're trying to follow all the rules in holding this event, and uh, we won't hold you responsible for um, failing to do so. Okay, that's great. Um, I am going to ask a question about membership um, and how membership um, is looking for 2021. And uh, this person would like to know if they should wait to see if any of the Hope for Events activities are possible before renewing their membership or whether they can just go ahead now and renew. Jim, can we start with you? Well, I, I think that we've got a positive outlook on the season. And with events being at the citizen uh, sanction level, we're not going to ask people to pay for a UCI license unless they're uh, traveling out of the country. And I think, I think that will help us to reduce the barrier. And, you know, if you wanted to wait until we have calendar announcements early January, that, that would be probably a good time, good timing for you. Because I think what you'll see is that there is a reasonable number of events. And I think as we see the other people are going to come forward and want to put on some events. So I think we're going to have a reasonable season ahead of us. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to the fall and, and maybe even going extending into the cyclocross season where we will have events this year. So we have our winter events. We're going to have mountain bike or road, road events over the summer. And I'm pretty hopeful that we'll have a cyclocross season and, and then we get back into track season in the winter. So I think it's a, I think I would say go buy it. I don't think you'll be I'd disappointed. Say so too. We did the right thing this year as well as, as we said that, you know, we recognize the season was shot. So we made the bold statement of saying, unlike any other province in the country, we'll give you a credit or a refund and you can apply it to this year's membership or the 2021 membership. So that is uh, great information. And, you know, as, as I've experienced with all kinds of other sports uh, within Ontario, it's very much um, sort of a family affair. Everybody is trying to help everybody else out. And um, as you said, the work goes on. So um, get that membership and then hopefully we'll be able to uh, um, get things back to normal sort of as quickly as possible. Jim, do you mind giving me the website address for people um, if they want to be in touch? I think he may be on mute again. OntarioCycling.org, my apologies. OntarioCycling.org, is that right? That is correct. 
do you know what? Um, there has been so much great information that has come out of this session. I would like to thank all of the panelists and we are getting you out of here six minutes early. You're welcome. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. I'm PJ Kwong and Ontario Cycling, you rock. A big, a big warm thank you, PJ. Thank you very much for doing this. And thank Happy you to, to all of our panelists. Good night. Bye for now.